Thank you for this large crowd. Our speaker appreciates it, and we do. I'm Michael Ehrman. I'm president of the Historical Society. I've been missing in action the last few months. We took a vacation, and I actually will be gone in May. And the first thing I want to do is to thank Helen Wilson, and I'd like you to stand our vice president. <laughs> Betty Connolly, our other vice president. And Audrey Glickman, our many jack of trades. <laughs> they, they, and, and Patty Hughes in the back. They, they actually ran this group for the last two months, and I didn't really have to come back. They did such a good job. But I thought I'd check in and say hello to everyone, at least for a month. So here we are. The uh, Historical Society is a membership organization. As you notice, we do not charge for our key event, which is these talks, which we're now on a talk about 110 or 120 in our history, and we do 11 months a year. And you should uh, feel free to keep coming whether you're a member or not, but you also should free, feel free to join our group so we can do all the community outreach that we'd like. As I was explaining to uh, uh, some folks who were here early. One of the things that we do that kind of discriminates in favor of our members is an annual walking tour, which this year is on June 4th. Uh, we're going to do Frick Park uh, with the help of the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. It's five dollars for members and eight dollars for non-members, but the odds are very likely that uh, the size that we can afford will probably just be available for members this year. Looks like that. What I told folks before was, if anyone who's not a member and not interested in joining tonight uh, wants to fill out a form in the back without paying, we'll see if there are a few left, which I, I'll call you about in the next few weeks. But if you join tonight, you get the, the uh, not member rate for the walking tour and you're guaranteed a slot because we still have some left. Call that bribery, whatever, uh, feel free. The other thing that you as a member get is a, um, a newsletter that's sent out once a month and is getting better and better uh, thanks to, uh, to Helen and uh, her crew. There are more and more essays in that that are so good that some people keep saying to me, well, we ought to distribute them publicly, but uh, we are at this point distributing them to the member as a membership newsletter. So that's the, the other incentive that we can, can afford to you as a member. We'd like you to join just to the loyalty or appreciation of what we do. Our activities briefly, we have a, uh, uh, we, we have a museum board, I like to call it, at the uh, uh, Squirrel Hill Library now with rotating exhibits, which Helen and Betty had been responsible for. We also have uh, our monthly meetings, and you have the schedule. Just two comments. Helen's son, Todd Wilson, who's getting quite a name in our neighborhood as the bridge engineer par excellence, is going to talk about bridges in Squirrel Hill. And I need to note that a canceled meeting on the Penn Brewery uh, is now sc scheduled for July 26th. So we have two meetings in July before we have a summer break. Same place, same, same Tuesday night, 7.30. Please note that a number of people were disappointed that uh, we didn't have that. So then we have the walking tour. Uh, new activities are being worked on all the time, but those are you know, the core things that we do. Um, I want to introduce two other board members, Ralph Lund, sitting there. Uh, Jim Hammond is back here somewhere in the back. And Audrey wanted to talk for a minute about a special event that's coming up this summer. Thank you, Michael. This is the 200th anniversary of the City of Pittsburgh's incorporation. And there's a number of official events that the mayor's office has planned, and there are 
a zillion other events and our programs are also affiliated and we're cross-listed with all the 200th anniversary <coughs> events. And one big one is the descendants of all the mayors prior to this one and including this one will have a parade downtown on July 9th. It's a Saturday and I believe the parade steps off at one o'clock so people would be gathering earlier and we're looking to have a representation we reserved a spot so if you want to come and march as a part of the Squirrel Hill Historical Society there's a list on the back table you can write your name and phone number and we'll do something I'm not sure what maybe we can all stand on each other's shoulders I don't know we can carry a big sign of history we'll think of something t-shirts thank you Mike. We want to, before we decide, we want to see how many people are able to do that. This is a nice opportunity to be part of Pittsburgh history on that nice summer day. I'm sure it will be. And so please consider joining us for that, whether you're a member or not. Our speaker tonight, Roland Vendelin, do I pronounce that correctly? Roland's a member of the Historical Society. He was a school teacher in Pittsburgh. He's from Newcastle. He's also done some teaching in the community colleges. He's also trained and, and was for a, a, been a therapist after a teacher. But for many years of his life, he's loved history like so many of us do, although he's done more about it. He's been telling historic stories off and on in his life in events like this, etc. And tonight, he's put together a very unusual talk. I know it's unusual just from the highlights, on what he calls white Indians, which are captives of the, the Native Americans on the western frontier. So we're, we're going back to the 18th century today, and here's Roland to bring us along. Thank you, Mike, and welcome to the presentation on white Indians on the western Pennsylvania frontier. Now, Native Americans frequently kidnapped white settlers for inclusion into their tribes. The captured whites responded in different ways to their captivity, anywhere from revulsion against the Native Americans to an affinity towards those who had captured them. But before we explore the different responses, let us see what the map of the New World looked like. Oops. Here we are. This is pre-contact with uh, Europeans. And uh, you can see that the whole eastern part of the United States was broken down into a variety of, of different tribes. This would have been New York, Pennsylvania, and into Ohio there. And it's hard to see what the groups were, but I just wanted to show you that the Indians were spread throughout the area. <coughs> now, by 1689, this is what the uh, uh, map of North America looked like and the claimants. You have running along the eastern seaboard the British making claims, and their claims also went out to here, the Mississippi. Actually, their charters read that they would be from a certain latitude to a certain latitude and then from sea to sea, which had not yet been explored. That was later, during the Treaty of Paris, cut back until, uh, until the Mississippi River. Um, you also had the British up in here, where Hudson, ha Hudson uh, Bay is, where Henry Hudson had <coughs> had explored this area, and the French coming down the St. Lawrence Seaway, and then down the Mississippi, and then eventually down the, the Ohio. And they would come down and make claims along the rivers, where the British would make it from the seacoast in. And then in the south, 
was uh, the Spanish. And when you get crisscrossed, that's where you have uh, mutual claims, either English and French or uh, French and Spanish, in some cases uh, English and Spanish. Now, before I take a look at Pennsylvania, I'd like to show you a, a capture that occurred up in what was at the time Massachusetts Bay Colony. In 1697, the Abenaki Indians killed 27 white settlers and kidnapped 13 others. Why did they take the hostages? To replenish their, their tribal losses, which occurred through war and disease. Included among the hostages in this incident were Hannah Dunstan, her infant daughter Martha, and Hannah's neighbor, Mary Neff. Uh, Martha was killed during the, uh, 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 the escape. And 12 of the Abenathi, including two men, three women, and seven children, went off on a di divergent path from the rest of the natives. And they took Hannah, Mary, and a 14-year-old boy named Samuel Leonardson, who had been captured the previous year. And they took him from Haverhill, up across the land, up into what was north of Concord, into what today would be uh, New Hampshire. And this is the Merrimack River. Okay. So, Hannah and Mary and Samuel did not like the idea of being captives. So what they did was at night, well, most, most of their captors were sleeping, they killed and scalped uh, 10 of the 12. Two of them got, got away. Um, and then they got one of the canoes and they sneaked out at night and start paddling down the Merrimack uh, uh, River. Now when they got back, can you read that? For those, of, for those of you that want to, go ahead, go ahead and read it. I'll, I'll just give you a, a brief summary. Uh, but um, while I'm talking, you can just uh, you can read this. Why did they scalp them? Because prior to the year prior to their being captured, there had been a bounty on scalps that the uh, colony was paying for any Indian scalp that, that was presented to them. Well, they had stopped that, but they're thinking, well, maybe they'll still recognize that and they will they'll, uh, uh, grant us money. So what you can see from here, there's a petition to the governor and to the Assembly of Massachusetts, and this went before the General Court. And the General Court made a decision. Now, this was Hannah Dunstan's husband who made this petition. Because at that time, women were not permitted to own property or to make, uh, make or have legal judgments. So her husband made the petition, and they ended up for the scalps and for their, their courage and having killed the, the Indians and whatnot, they provided her with 25 pounds, and then both Mary and Samuel were granted uh, 12 and a half pounds by the court. Okay? Can I move on? Does anybody want to get a chance to look at it? Yes. I want one more chance at that one. At this? The white people scalp the Indians? No, these ones did. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to isolate that. That's yeah. kind yeah. of new information. Yeah. 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 White men introduced that. Yeah. Our Native Americans did not scalp. White men introduced that. And uh, because they're they being paid to, 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 to do so. And, and a lot of that got started between the French and the English. Where, you know, the, Fr the French were behind a lot of this stuff, encouraging the Indians to... To, to, to attack the English. And they said, oh, by the way, you know, um, not only do you get scalps, which were a point of honor, but we'll pay you for this, too. So it's sort of, yeah, it started there. And so it comes back around the other direction now. Comes around. So, yeah, you got it. Okay. <laughs> and as a result, this is still there. Hannah Dodson becomes the first woman in America to receive her own statue. Where is this at? Pardon me? Where's the statue? It's in Massachusetts. I, mean, I believe it's in Haverhill. Okay. 
Does she have a knife no. in her hand? <laughs> this will give you a picture, again, what the claims look at like by 1700. It's a little clearer. But again, you've got the British on the eastern sea coast, the French on the interior, uh, the British again, Spain, and unexplored up, up in here. So this is, this is what the, the country looks like. Now, we're going to come closer to home. We're going to come to Pennsylvania. And a lot of this takes place during the French and Indian War and Pontiac's Rebellion and even beyond that. This one took place, uh, uh, this next one took place um, after uh, the uh, Revolutionary War. This is a contemporary map. And this is closer to home. You might recognize this as you look at it. On May 22, 1792, Massey Harbison and her three sons were awakened by 32 members of Native American raiding party, two of whom were white men dressed as Indians. The prior year, they had settled, settled in sight of Reed Station, which was a community fort. But, but was manned by 40 men who were provided by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The natives <coughs> killed three-year-old Samuel and dragged five-year-old Robert and Massey, who was also holding her, her baby, John, uh, out of their, their cabin. Now, where their cabin was, was on what is today the present River Forest Golf Course which is right across from Freeport. Uh, this bridge going across 356. Mm. Okay. Now there's a plaque in there on the golf course. <coughs> and of course their cabin was there, but also there was this uh, fort. But the, it, the Indians got in there and out of there so quickly that the soldiers did not have a chance to come to their, their rescue, even though it was within view. It was right next to it. Um, and they took them from here over to here into this area there. Um, Mary had a, an uncle, John Curry, who had horses, and they had already come over and stolen, the Indians had stolen the horses from John Curry. So they brought them back, and they were riding these horses over to here, and they got near the, this is the Allegheny River, and goes up here, and this is the Kiskaminicus River, okay? So when those two joined, they came down over the hill um, in there. Now, there's a little road that leads close to that, but you don't exactly have access. You come to the bottom of the road, and it says, railroad property, do not enter. But the history buffs, that's just a suggestion. That's not a, <laughs> a command or anything. So I couldn't like exactly take a tour, but I, I had to go take a look at it. And there's a railroad trestle that goes across there. And you can see, what you can see is a very steep ravine there. And uh, they had ridden down that ravine on the horses. And the, the eastern uh, woodland Indians were not proficient on horses. And uh, Mary herself was. She was on a horse. but. Uh, her five-year-old son, Robert, was with one of the Indians, and they did a, you know, a tumble down over there. Uh, he wasn't injured, but, uh, it was, you know, it was quite, quite frightful. Now, they get down to the bottom, and they get in the water, and they have canoes hidden in there. And they take these canoes, and then they paddle over across to what was known as Todd's Island. It's no longer there because there was backfield, and it's now part of uh, uh, Freeport. The, the, the city of Freeport. And then from Todd, Borough. Uh, the borough. Yeah, that's it. Um, from there, they come on down to the Buffalo River, come up the bu Buffalo River a bit, and then cut north northwest towards towards Butler proper. Okay. This is Massey here, uh, Harbison. Now, they take her up to just <laughs> north of Butler, across across the Conequinescent Creek, and there's a Indian, the Indian village is there. So they take her there. The first night she stays there. The second night she escapes. And this is the path that she takes. 
Here's what, uh, I'm sorry. This is where they started out. They went up northwest to Butler. This is the Conoquinesson Creek along here. And they get up there, and she escapes. And as her husband, who was like a ranger and an Indian fighter and whatnot, he had taught her, whenever you're, you're going to, you, you know, try to get away from somebody, go over rocky ground so your, 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 your uh, uh, footprints cannot be followed. All right, so she does this. And, she, and also go the opposite direction that you're planning on going. So she starts out north over a rocky area, then cuts down following the Conoquinessing River Creek, and then cuts on down towards Mars, coming down. And this, this whole trip, you know, uh, from, from here over to here, it takes six days. Now she's traveling with, with the baby. Oh, I, I didn't mention to you, on Todd Island, uh, young Robert, the five-year-old, wouldn't keep quiet, so the Indians killed him. He, you don't want to have uh, the whites that are following you have a signal. So, uh, I mean, that was common practice. So, they kill him, and she is escaping down, down here, and then comes across Pine Creek, which is the same creek that Christopher Gist and George Washington had, had followed in, in uh, 1753, um, and she recognized it. Comes across here, almost uh, fall, gets into a, a, a group of rattlesnakes, comes over to what's now Fox Chapel, comes down uh, Squaw Run into and onto the uh, Allegheny River. And there's a cabin she's seen, she, she's um, uh, white settlers come to her rescue. And by that time, her feet were all mangled. She had like 60-some, like haws. Have you ever seen the, the, the fruit of a hawthorn? Some of them about this long. They're sharp points. The Indians used to use them for, for like needle and thread. And they were sticking up through her feet. She couldn't walk for months at a time because they had to pull those out. She had no shoes on. All she had was a nightgown that she was traveling in with this young baby. Uh, on that. So this is a rather harrowing experience. So uh, she didn't kill anybody, but she wasn't real fond of being a, uh, uh, a captive of, a, of the Native Americans either. Okay. And Massey lies at rest in Freeport Cemetery in Pennsylvania, which was actually a hotbed for captured settlers, especially during, as I mentioned, the French and Indian War and the Pontiac's Rebellion. Okay, now, when we've taken a look at her, and what you might notice, I'm not going chronologically, but I'm going step by step based on how the captors responded to their, to their Indian cap, uh, uh, those that captured them. Okay. Let's take a look at 1755, and this is as General Braddock is marching towards Fort Duquesne. <coughs> and you might recognize this picture. This is General Braddock's army crossing the Monongahela at... Um, Turtle Creek. Mm -hmm. Turtle Creek would be right behind, on the other side, right behind this uh, tree. And uh, this would be the town of Tur Turtle Creek. Um, now, it looks like they're able to walk on water, but they're not. There was a drought that year in 1755, and the stream, actually it's the Mon, the river was only about three, three and a half feet deep. Okay. Pardon me? Inches or feet? Feet. Feet. Now, uh, when they talked about it, they talked about it being right below their knees, right above their knees, that type of thing like that. And when they crossed, they usually crossed where something, where another stream came in, because there tended to be sandbars there on that. So that's one of the reasons why they're, they're crossing here. Um, now, at this time, just a few days before this is occurring, there's a young man named James Smith from... Um, Conocentia, Pennsylvania, which today we would know as Mercerburg, Pennsylvania. 
and he was abducted by two Delaware and a Gonawanaga uh, Indian uh, while he was building a road near Raystown, which is what we today call Bedford. Okay? And uh, he was taken to Fort Duquesne because uh, the French held, that, held Fort Duquesne at that time. That's why Braddock was, was going there. And he gets there, and they make him run through a gauntlet. Is everybody familiar with what a gauntlet is? Okay. So, we saw those movies. He's running through, and they're hitting them, they're banging him on the head. They knock him unconscious. So, he wakes up like the next day, and he's inside the court, and a French doctor's taking care of him. He's feeding them brandy to, you know, sort of take care of his wounds. And then they send in one of the Delaware who had captured him to interrogate him. They want to know what he knows about Braddock's forces. Okay, so he's, they're talking. He doesn't know a lot because he was, he was a young man. He was just taking supplies to, 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 to Braddock. And he asked him, he says, Why'd you guys knock me out like that? You know, well, why do I have to go through all that thing where everybody hits everybody? And he, and the guy says, oh, that's the, the, he says, that's just our way of saying howdy. <laughs> yeah, he was over there, so, so okay, so he's learning a lot there. Now, as you know, what happens in Braddock, but Jen Smith doesn't know this, and he hears all kind of rowdiness, and he sees. All these Indian and, and, and soldiers coming back. This is how they're coming back along, and this would be where Fort Duquesne is. And they're coming back with all of the paraphernalia and everything that they've been able to take from the battlefield. And they're whooping and hollering and all that. And he figures it's the British coming to save him. But he finds out it's the French who have defeated the British to his amazement who are now there. Now, Across from Fort Duquesne, there was a series of three islands. Actually, it was sometimes a peninsula. They were sandbars, and it depended on how much water was there, whether they were broken up into uh, islands or whether they were broken up into just one, one little peninsula. But when it went, where they were islands, the middle one was called Smoky Island, because that's the one that the <coughs> Delaware Indians had a encampment on. And it's called Smoky because that's where they tortured and burned their, 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 their captives. And so James Smith is watching from the fort, and he's seeing all these captor, people that are captured getting burned to death. And so he's sure that this is what's going to be uh, in store for him. So from Fort Duquesne, the natives take him and paddle up the Allegheny to Catani. And then three weeks later, they paddle to the Muskegon River, up to the village of uh, Tuluhas. Now, it's not on here, but the river comes in, you have a a western and you have an eastern. The eastern is the Tuscarora, you have the western is what was known as the uh, uh, White Woman Creek at that time. Okay. If anybody's interested in a nice day trip, that in the area is very interesting. It's, it's Conchocton, uh, Ohio. And not only does it have the history of being a major uh, Delaware uh, encampment, it also <coughs> later became uh, a major spot on the uh, um, canal. And there's a reenacted canal. How far is that from New Philadelphia? Uh, a couple stone throws. Yeah. Uh, it, it would make a half a day in one place, a half a day in the, in, in the other place. Although Roscoe Village, which is the, uh, you can spend the whole day there. There's a nice little uh, place where you can eat that used to be a, uh, uh, like a warehouse. There's a very nice museum. One of the nicest collections of Native Americans, especially Western bowls and, and basketry, and a great collection of Asian art where you get to see both Chinese and Japanese art together, and then you can eyeball and see what the very distinctive differences are between them. So 
Maybe you make it two different days. And then, yes? At this point, are you saying that a lot of the Indians could speak English and French and vice versa? Or would it just sort of be pidgin English and hand signals? Um, more, more of a, a pidgin English, but, but, but they, they could. There were more that could speak French because the French and the Indians yeah. got along a lot better. What you would have was intermarriage, okay? So, I mean, you heard of Kilbuck Township. That was actually, Kilbuck was actually part French, part Indian. So he, he spoke both, both languages, okay? Uh, Chartiers Creek, Chartiers was uh, uh, a Shawnee, again, part, part Indian, part, part French. And what, what would happen is, it wasn't so much with the British or Americans that, that were able to speak it, but these captives, once they were living, uh, among among the the, um, uh, the natives, they learned the languages. Okay, so they became interpreters and, and things of that sort. That's it, a good question. Okay. So, what happens with um, what was I talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Smith. Oh, James Smith. Okay. So, James Smith ends up in Ohio, and what happens to him there? These, these three Native American women take him and they're dipping him in the water. And he's fighting and fighting because he figures, oh, they got a new torture for him, they're going to drown him. <laughs> and they said to him, quit fighting, we're not going to hurt you, we're trying to help you out. So he stops fighting, they dip him in the water, and then there's a meeting. And this is James Smith, after they have taken, plucked out his hair and dressed him like a Native American, and his... Native American brethren are now telling him, and this is recorded, the head man saying, I have something to say. And what he tells them is that all of the white blood has been removed from your body by the dipping. Is that sort of familiar? A little bit like a Baptist? So you are now a full-blooded Indian. And once you were accepted by the Indians, you were totally accepted by, by, by the Indians. Uh, it, didn't matter where you came from, what your background was, uh, if you were from another tribe, if you were white, if you were black, you were, you know, once you were considered to be Indian, you were an Indian. So they are telling them this, and now for the next five years, James Smith joins his, his Native American family, he had several brothers, and they're following these paths and the waterways throughout Ohio. What would happen? You live in one place during one part of the year and then you go out onto a hunting ground. So you move to another another area and you would hunt there and then you you sometimes you went back to where you were staying before and sometimes you'd move to a different area. But a lot of it had to do with hunting and and and, and, and the ground and, and whatnot where you where you would stay. Because they, they weren't required to stay in one place. So they do basically all the river systems in um, um, Ohio, and then they make a decision, his, uh, several of his Native American brothers decide that they want to return to their original uh, village, which is Conawana, and that is about nine miles north of Montreal, okay? They traveled very far. I mean, it's, it's impressive how, many, how much distance they did. And a lot of this was by canoe. They're paddling upstream a, a lot of this and, and over the, you know, the, the Great Lakes and whatnot, too. So they traveled to, uh, back to their village, and J James Smith decides that he would like to go back to his, uh, his, his village, the white village. Okay? Even though he's very fond of, of, of those people who have adopted them, 
okay? And he has a great deal of respect for him because he writes about him uh, with great praise later on. And, but he decides he wants to go back. And just to give you a little point, when he was captured, he, he was in love at the time. He was smitten by some young girl back at his, his village. And he was planning on getting married, and then he was swept away. So like five years later, he's trying to think about he'd like to get back home. Now what he finds out is that there is a ship, a prisoner ship, in, in, docked in Montreal that the French have there, and they have British prisoners on it, and if he can get himself onto there and become a British prisoner, that ship, they're planning on taking it back to the colonies and trading those in for, for Frenchmen. So he, sneak, he gets himself on there, gives himself up, and what happens is it doesn't sail because the British have a barricade of, of St. Louis Seaway, and he has to stay in this ship as a prisoner for like uh, three months. So finally, they ship off, he gets back, and he gets back to Conakity, okay? And um, his friends and his relatives all thought he was dead. And he finds out that just days before he returned, that his girlfriend had married another man. So for many, many months, James Smith carried a heavy heart. Mary Jemison. Mary Jemison was 15 years old. She was captured at Marsh Creek, which today we would identify as Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, she's taking over land. She was captured with all, all of her yeah. family. What year was that? Pardon? What year? What year? 1756. Okay. Again, we're talking. Uh, Seven Years' War, French and Indian uh, War period of time. Okay? This is Mary Jefferson. And her family's all captured, but they kill the other members of her family. And she knows this not because she sees them, but, the, but they kept her rest of her family further back. And when the natives came up, they had like hoops and they had scalps on them. And she was able to recognize and identify the scalps based on the color of the hair and also the size. And she realized that they killed and scalped all of her family members, but not her. No. They're traveling over land, and they take her to Fort Duquesne. Uh, Fort Duquesne, and later on, Fort Pitt are the main frontier uh, uh, forts in this area. So that's where all the basic activity would go. So at Fort Duquesne, two Seneca women adopt her and rename her Denhawagas, which means two falling voices. And they take her to what we know today as Mingo Junction, right here on Long Mill, Ohio. Pardon me? Down near Bridgeville. Yeah, south, south of there. More closer to Steubenville. And it was, um, um, it was at that time known as uh, Mingo Bottom. So I like to go over some of these historical places, see if there's anything to find out. You know, go over and see if we can talk to some of the locals. So not that all that long ago, I go over to Mingo Junction. And Mingo Junction makes Braddock look prosperous. I mean, it's just, it, <coughs> there ain't much to write home about. And I figure, well, I'm not going to, there isn't that, you know, you go into, you go into a, a, a coffee shop or something like that, and you talk to somebody, but there weren't any to go into. So I just went and looked, and I said, well, that, that was a good idea. Or no, that was an idea, but it wasn't going to take me anywhere. So. In the winter, the following winter, they relocate to the Scioto River, okay, which flows into the Ohio. And um, this again is, is, is a camping ground. 
Now what had occurred is the Seneca women had lost a brother in battle. So they chose Digawanus to replace him. So it didn't have to be the same age, didn't have to be the same gender. You could just take uh, someone to replace that lost one that you had. And that's, that's what they, they chose. And the sisters arranged a marriage for, I'm going to go back and call her Mary, Mary Jemison, for Mary with a Delaware Indian. So she marries this man, and they have a son, and uh, Mary, the husband, her son, two brothers, decide to move to New York, okay, where they were originally from. And she's... They're traveling up there, and then... Well, what? Oh, how did you do that? Yeah, you had your finger on the button. <coughs> I need help. That's why I think nobody over 12 should be permitted to help. <laughs> Do you want to? Oh, all right. I just moved along. Mary married a native or Mary? Where's Mary? Yeah, a Native American, a, a, a member of the Delaware Indian tribe. Moves to New York, okay. Now what happens is he decides to stay back and hunt, okay, in Ohio. And he ends up getting killed. He never does make it up there. So Mary moves up there. And she moves up to this area up in here along the Genesee River. And she marries another man. She marries a... Um, a Seneca named uh, um, Hayakato, and they have six more children. And during the Revolutionary War, Hayakato and the Seneca, along with three other of the Iroquois tribes, there were six by this time, fight with the British against the Americans. Nice. And two of the tribes to, to fought with the Americans against the against the British. So. During this time, General John Sullivan, who's uh, um, uh, representing the, the American Armed Forces, sends 5,000 troops to destroy the Seneca villages. Because he wants to totally wipe out their living space and their, their corn crops because he doesn't want to give them any base of operation to, 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 fight, to, to fight from. And he just totally wipes out that area. So. She and her children, now her husband is off fighting, but she and her children move from up in here down to around this area, down along the, uh, again, along the uh, uh, Genesee River, uh, but <coughs> near what's known as uh, Gard Gardenia Flats, which today, if you visit, would be Castile, New York. So she moves there, and she moved with um, and worked on a farm as a tenant farmer uh, for a couple uh, escaped slaves, okay? Uh, now they eventually had to move on because they were, they were runaway slaves. They couldn't stay in one place all that long and they left the land and she stayed there and worked the land and eventually took over that, that land. She didn't steal it from them, they just had to move on because of their predicament. Okay, in 1797, Here's a picture of Mary Jemison uh, in the year just prior to her death. She receives a deed to the land that she's living on from the chief of the Six Nations. That, this was Seneca land, uh, which were one of the tribes of the, of the Iroquois. And in 1817, she receives naturalized citizenship and can take legal title of the land. As an Indian, she couldn't have title to it. She could as a white woman. Okay. The Indians were only permitted to have title as a, as a tribe, not as individuals. So she becomes a naturalized citizen and uh, gets a uh, natural title to it. And she became known uh, as the white woman of Genesee. And then in 1823, she wrote a narrative of the life of um, Mrs. Mary Jemison. And in 1831, she sold her tract of land and moved to Buffalo Creek Reservation. And on 
September 19, 1833, the voice of Diawagas, also known as Mary Jemison, fell silent. And she too has a statue commemorating her life and, and history and heroism. Okay. Now, let's take a look at a, uh, another uh, captive a little bit closer to home. This is in central Pennsylvania. Right here at, who's, uh, who's? This is the Lehigh. This is, uh, what is it? Uh, Lewis, Lewistown, I think. Yes, yes, Lewistown, exactly. Not far from uh, <coughs> those that aren't familiar with Lewistown, because there's state prison there. Those that haven't spent time might be more familiar with uh, State College. Yes. What is it, maybe 20, 25 yes. State College? Yeah, that's right. People that know that, that, that area? It's Mifflin County. It's Mifflin? Mifflin. Yeah, the cent central part of the state. Oops, sorry. So. In 1856, Lieutenant Edward Armstrong was commander of, of Fort Granville, uh, which was along the Juniata, which is uh, in Lewistown, Pennsylvania. Um, the French and the Indians, primarily the Indians, attack it. They kill him. Now, Sergeant John Turner is the next in command. He surrenders the fort because the, the natives are burning it down. They don't have a chance to get out of there otherwise. So, and then they take them to Catanning, okay, because there, there was a Delaware Shawnee village at, at Catanning. Catanning was a, a key uh, Native American village. So, they're at Catanning, and uh, John Turner is burned at the stake uh, at, at Catanning, but the other members of his family are kept as captives. Now, Colonel John Armstrong, for whom Armstrong County is named, attacks Catanning and, and destroys the Indian village. But most of the Indians and the, the captives get away. Okay? And so they had, um, the Turners had a, a family of five boys. There were, uh, they were a blended family. We didn't call it that, that what we do now. It's like the Brady Bunch. Because she had been married to a man named Gertie. And he had died, and then she married John Turner. So she had four Gertie boys that, that were all like teenagers. And um, she had a, a small son, John Jr., who was less than a year old. Okay? So what happens is Mary, whenever they attack Catani, uh, is taken away by, by a remnant of the Delaware, and she goes to live with the Delaware. And uh, Thomas, the older one, uh, is uh, Colonel, Colonel Armstrong gets a hold of him and he takes him down to his farm in, in Carlisle and takes him on as an apprentice to teach him farming. And then the other three boys, or the other four boys actually, uh, George and James and Simon are all taken by the, the, the Shawnee, the Delaware, and the Seneca, and uh, uh, Simon Gertie is, is, is taken by the, by the Seneca, and John Jr. is also taken by the Delaware, but none of them are taken to the same place. Okay, now what would happen is in subsequent years, whenever there'd be some kind of agreement, and, and Indians uh, had some kind of agreement with white settlers, one of the things that was required is that they returned captives. So, and most of this was done at Fort Pitt, because again, that was the same. By this time, Forbes had captured Fort Pitt, and this was the center of, of, of the frontier. So, they're coming back to uh, realizing this. Mary, after about five years of captivity, gets her freedom in one of these exchanges. She wants to be close to Fort Pitt, because she wants to be there when her, her, her sons eventually filled her back there. So. By 1761, Mary Gerger Turney is settled in, any idea? Squirrel Hill. Squirrel Hill. Yes, right here. So, well, where is right here? Well, let's take a look. Okay? Now, subsequently, her other sons are released, 
the older ones get released, they come and move in with her, and then about 10 years after his capture, John Turner Jr. is released. He's 11 years old, speaks only uh, a native Indian uh, language, doesn't know any English, doesn't recognize his mother, but she recognizes him. Okay, so the whole family is reunited uh, because of her, her efforts. And um, here is, that oh, doesn't come out real clearly, but I'll tell you basically what it is. These are, this, this is a patent, which we, could, we would call deeds today, uh, that shows in the city of Pittsburgh, it wasn't the city of Pittsburgh at that time, but between the, the Allegheny and the Mon, these would be all the properties that, that, that uh, were claimed in the, and, and existed in this place. And in 1769, the land office in western Pennsylvania was opened, and Simon and George Gurdy were among the first 18 applicants uh, to claim land in, uh, in Scarborough. Yeah. Now, we'll see how clear this is. A little bit clearer. All right. Take this bin right here, okay? That's what we're looking at, and coming right in here. Okay, got it? Here is John Turner's property. It's surveyed, and then he gets a warrant, which is a claim on it, and then he gets a patent on 1789, and he gets this property. Later on, he purchases more land in 1802, which goes up to here. And if you can get the sense of where it is, this is, this is Squirrel Hill. This is Squirrel Hill. This is uh, Greenville. This is uh, Hazelwood, which was then known as Scotch Bottom. Are you using this light? Uh, no. Yeah. You, you, you can, you you can say, that, so you can say that that, that you shut the light off. You can say that the eastern boundary of John Turner's claim there is roughly where Celine Street is today. Yes, you can. In fact, there was a cabin there at the time. Well, I mean, just, a, just by good, you got a good eye. As a reference on this map. Here. Yeah. And I have a friend that helped us out with that. Now, this drawing in the purple line, this is thanks to Anita Kalina, who was a native of, uh, of Greenfield and a friend of the Gerties. And this is, she's drawn what areas that, that covers, okay? And yeah, Montclair, Exeter, up in, up in Greenfield, mm -hmm. coming over Murray Avenue, Beachwood, <coughs> okay? Then coming up across the parkway towards Taylor Alderdice, up as far past Cavode Street, okay? On, you know, Whiteman, the mm -hmm. little side street off of Whiteman. And then coming back down, across the, towards Picasso, across the parkway again, mm -hmm. and then back across, here's Greenfield Avenue, Dealey, for those of you familiar with some of those, mm -hmm. and then back in, into that area here. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is the land that they had. They had a good bit of land. Um, John Turner becomes rather prosperous, and if you haven't got it yet, make sure you go on the tour with Helen Wilson, because you can, you can find where John Turner and his wife are buried. And that church that's right next to the Turner graveyard was donated by John Turner to the, to the community. Now they made, what they did was grew crops and they sold them to the soldiers at um, Fort Pitt. So they, they did rather well on that. Okay, now, it might be a little confusing because I told you that George and Simon had basically taken over that land. Well, they had to give it up. And they gave it up to John Turner. And uh, we're going to see in a couple minutes just why they had to give it up. Do you have any record of the instrument by which they gave up that land? No, but <laughs> <coughs> I read something where the one Gertie, who lives up in the North Hills, I think it might be Shaler, <coughs> who's like 84 or so now, claimed that he had that, but I've never seen it. I contacted him. Nina gave me his number, I contacted him, but I guess he's getting a little long in the tooth, maybe getting tired. 
people coming and going. You know? <coughs> so, uh, no, I don't know. He just he didn't get back to me on that. But I had that same curiosity on that. I understand it exists, but I've not seen it. So, this is Simon Gurdy. And prior to the Revolutionary War, he was a trader, a guide, a soldier, an interpreter, an army recruiter. This goes back to your question about who was able to speak. He spent, he spent a better part of uh, eight, eight, 18 years with the, with the Seneca. And then he also learned other languages when he was there, because they were intermingling with the other tribes then. So he, he, was, he couldn't read, but he was able to, uh, by ear, he could translate what, what, what was being said. And that was some of his jobs. Whenever, whenever uh, officials would get together, they needed someone who could be, a, be able to speak. And, and, and that's where they got them. Now, he fought, he's fighting for the British, he's fighting for the, for the Americans. I've got to give you a little bit of background so you can see just who he's fighting for. Virginia is making a claim on Pennsylvania. Here's the Pennsylvania borders. Virginia is claiming land that's in West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. So this, better, this part of West, Western Pennsylvania was claimed and to some degree settled by Virginia. And Pennsylvania is always claiming, is also claiming, and it ends up in, in a war. It's called Dunmore's War, mm -hmm. and he was the lieutenant governor of, uh, of Virginia just prior to the Revolutionary War, 1774 up until about 1776. And this is who um, Simon Gurdy is fighting with. All right, and he fought with some people that might be familiar with you. Uh, George Rogers Clark, uh, Simon <coughs> Kenton, Daniel Boone, Colonel William Crawford, and Daniel Morgan, okay? And they, they're all fighting uh, for the Virginians, against the Pennsylvanians, and also they were trying to eliminate the, uh, um, not the Seneca, but the Shawnee from the area, okay? So it had, it had a dual purpose on that, okay? And here is where the Shawnee villages were in Ohio at different times. And they're coming up trying to wipe out the, the Shawnee. So the Virginians are trying, because the Virginians were claiming land all the way up to Michigan. Okay? Which is another story. But they, so they were trying to eliminate whoever was on that land, Pennsylvanians, in this case, uh, Shawnee. So... <coughs> The prior, you know, the Revolutionary War breaks out, and Simon Gurdy has a discussion with his fellow brethren. Don't, don't forget, he's not only uh, an American; he's he's a, he's a Seneca, all right. Uh, so his his Seneca brother, Guy Suda has a conversation with him and tells him, I don't think that the Americans are willing to coexist with the Native Americans. They plan to take over our land. They, they, plan, they plan to eliminate us. And some things occur that, that at least to Simon Gurdy, sort of suggest that he might be right. We don't have time to go into them in detail, but a couple of things were um, a Shawnee uh, chief cornstalk who was a, an American ally, was uh, uh, executed by, uh, by Americans. And then there was something called the Squall Campaign, where they sent an army out and they couldn't find any, anybody to, f to fight, but, so they shot some uh, Native American kids and, and, and old men and, and, and women. And it just looked like, well, we're going to go out and, you know, uh, the only good Indian is going to be a dead Indian type thing like that. So. Um, this doesn't sit well with, with Simon Gurdy, and as a result, uh, he joins up with the uh, um, the British. He goes he goes on to to, to, to he goes to Fort Duquesne, uh, Fort Detroit, and and joins the uh, the British. Okay, now what happens in 1782? is that there's a contingent of uh, military 
from Washington and Westmoreland County that goes up to the village of Gnaughton in um, uh, Ohio. Uh, Gnaughton, Newton, actually. And um, there's a group of Christian Moravian Indians that are peaceful, you know, praying Indians. They, they don't have any weapons or anything. And they just slaughter 92 of them. They take them into the church, they tell them they're going to take them back to Fort, Fort Pitt and make sure they have something to eat, and they just kill them. So, this, does, and they were mostly, they were Delaware. This doesn't sit well. Now, later in that, that same spring of 1782, Colonel William Crawford, who was George Washington's friend, he was also his land age, agent, leads a volunteer army to attack the Ohio Country Indians at Sandusky. Now, this is the upper Sandusky. The lower Sandusky is the one that's on the, on the, uh, the lake. The upper Sandusky is the one that's upstream on the Sandusky River. I'll show you a map in a, in a minute. And the Delaware capture Crawford and identify him as one of the participants in the Squaw Campaign, and they recognize his second-in-command, Williamson, who gets away um, as the man who who led the, the troops that, that killed the peaceful <coughs> Indians. So, basically, they decide to, uh, uh, the Delaware decide to uh, burn uh, Crawford at the uh, state. Uh, here's Crawford. Uh, Lyndon Carlson. Was burned. This is one, uh, Gertie had fought with him okay, during the Dunmore War. Uh, there's a message at Mingo Bottom that where, where the troops had, had uh, uh, sort of met originally, mm -hmm. and the natives see this with the, there would be messages on trees. You know, <coughs> sort of take a bark off and you write something in there. And what, they, what the soldiers had written were, take no quarter, men, women, or children. Which those of you familiar with military terminology means take no, take no enemies. If you're unable to provide them with quarters, you don't, Take or don't take you know, take no uh, hostages, you know, POWs. They're planning on killing off all the Indians when they go up there. So the, the natives knew this, all right. So when they get up there and they capture them, they're not going to be too friendly towards this group. Plus, they've already been killing people indiscriminately uh, in, among the Native Americans. So here they go from Mingo Bottom up through past the Nottinghuton up into Lower Sandusky, and Pipestown, this is Captain Pike, who's the leader of the uh, uh, Delaware. And he's the one, there were other Native American tribes involved in this, but he's the one that captures uh, uh, Crawford and decides to uh, burn him at stake. Now, the British were supporting the Indians, okay? And uh, Simon Gertie's representing the, the British. This would be Simon Gertie. And as a result, Simon is at the burning of, uh, of uh, Colonel uh, Crawford. And Lars got some things right. I mean, he didn't get this right. This would be more like the Lakota Indians out in the, the west. I mean, you didn't run through the forest with a bunch who, of feathers. Who is the artist on that? On this? I forget who it is. I knew it one time. When, when was that? This? Um, I, oh, this, this is in the 20th century this was done. Uh, on that. I'll have to put it in my memory bank. You know, next time I'll have to. Uh, it'll come up. But one of the things that is accurate, they did, he was naked and they were burning him. And if the Indians were going to save you, they painted your, red, your face red. If they were going to kill you, they painted you black. And both of those are painted black. Mm -hmm. So those are accurate, accurate uh, depictions of, of it. Um, the Gertie, as a result of this, becomes hated in American history. And he becomes persona non grata. But as they say, that's another story for another day. And there's a whole historical review on how Gertie should have been looked at, how he was looked at, and how he should have been looked at, because more information, more historical data has come in. I wrote an article about it a couple of years ago. But again, as I say, that's a story for, for another day. So 
This is the reason they joined the British, he and his brothers, they can't live in America. This is why they gave the land to, to, to John Turner. And then as a result, he moves up to Canada, across from Fort uh, Detroit, uh, in, a, in a township up there known as Malden, near Fort Malden. And he lives there for the better part of his life. During the War of 1812, he has to get out of there because it's too close to, to, to America. He has to go live with an Indian uh, uh, tribe and then comes back and spends his last days at, uh, at uh, his farm at, uh, at Walden. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I took some questions. Can I, can I open it up to questions? Please, like? please, please. Okay, sure. Yes. Um, years ago, my husband and I were in Ohio one day. We went to Gnaden Hutton. Ah. And we saw the Indian mounds there. Mm. And I didn't know the history. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now you have uh, the it was a Moravian. Could you repeat uh, uh, that question? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. She and her husband had gone to Gnadenhuden, and she'd seen the mounds there, but she didn't know what the history was behind it. It was a Moravian uh, missionary settlement where they were working with the Delaware. And if you go to eastern Pennsylvania, there was another Gnadenhuden there, mm -hmm. uh, that, and they moved from that one over over to, to, to this one on that. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, wait a minute. I always wanted to do this. You. <laughs> yeah, you, you, look at your chest. <laughs> uh, there wasn't anything Simon Gertie could do for Crawford, though. Did they you would say have, that again? They would, they would have killed Simon Gertie if he would have stepped in to save Crawford. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Captain Pike, you know, he kept negotiating to get him free. Yeah, and no. Pike... Oh, already said, said to him, he says, what are you arguing for? Didn't you see this face was painted back? You know, you're an Indian, you know, you know what that means. And he finally says to him, if you don't shut up and leave the, the subject alone, we're gonna, I'll build another stake right next to the <laughs> colonel. And you can burn with him, too. So, Gertie had enough sense to shut yeah, up yeah. at that time. Yeah. Yes? What are your sources for all these stories? Um... A number of different uh, things. There, some of them are um, actually I have a bibliography. I didn't I, I, I didn't bring it. Um, if you want it, it's Roland. It's R Vendyland at AOL dot com. Vendyland's V E N D. Why don't you send it to the historical society? Okay. Let me and do. If let anyone me. wants it, just send it to our website. Okay. And we'll get it to you. And then I'll I'll, I'll email it to you. But a number of these come from um, accounts that were written by by them themselves. James Smith wrote an account. Um, Mary Jemison wrote an account. And uh, Simon Gertie, there's a number of books on him. He's, uh, I mean, he's local, but he's, he's nationally, if not internationally, known as, a, as like a rogue, really interesting character. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he, he's been researched and written about, say, when Daniel Boone and others have been on that. Okay? Yes? Yeah. Millville was Gertie's run. Well, yes. That, that, that's Thomas Gertie. That's Thomas Gertie, who's the oldest. And he was a merchant. He had a trading post there. <coughs> and later on, he, he built another uh, trading post uh, somewhere uh, near Vandegrift on that. But that was Thomas Gurdy, the one that stayed. Thomas Gurdy and, and um, John Turner, Jr. are the two that stayed uh, uh, in white communities. The others... Uh, uh, lived in, in Native American communities on that. Yes? Do you have any knowledge of a captive from the Bedford, Pennsylvania area referred to as Indian Eve, E V E? Have you come across that? There's an understanding that when someone gives a presentation that's, that someone in the audience only asks questions to which the presenter has <laughs> 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 an answer. No, I Okay. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, but you have one chance, okay? You get another question, but you better make sure it's something Actually, I know about. You should pay him because he's the 
because you can now add it to your next lecture. On that, having not ever heard of the guy, I'll have to do a good bit of research on that. Her. It's a her. It's a her. E-V-E. -E. Yeah. Well, I have yeah. a friend who's a relative of hers. That's oh, okay. That's why I was personal interest. Yeah. And that was, that was, that was at Fort Bedford? Yeah, in the Bedford area. Do you know the period of time at all? <coughs> no, I'm afraid I don't. I'll have to look it up and see if I can find anything on that. But no, I, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Anybody have a better question? <laughs> yes. I just got an observation. That was down at... Uh, Fort Pitt Museum the other day, I was stunned to hear them in their exhibit on this same subject say that there were captives numbered in the thousands. Oh, the, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the, there were. And, and there were times when they give them back, they give a couple hundred back. And what's interesting, a lot of them didn't want to come back. They had to tie them up and bound them to come back. Because uh, when you lived with the Indians, you, they treated you really well. Let me, here, hold on a minute. Just a minute. I'm over the note on the Indian side on this one. Let me, let me read this short passage to you. This is from Mary Jemison. And she says, no people can live more happy than the Indians did in times of peace. Before the introduction of spiritous liquors amongst them, they, their lives were a continual round of pleasures. Their wants were few and easily satisfied. Their cares were only for today. The bounds of their calculation for future comfort did extend to the incalculable uncertainties of tomorrow. If peace ever dwell with men, it was in the former times, in the recesses from war, among now, uh, what are termed barbarians, talking about the Indians. The moral character of the Indians was, as I may be allowed to express, uncontaminated. Their fidelity was perfect and became proverbial. They were strictly honest, they despised deception and falsehood, and chastity was high in their veneration, and a violation of it was considered sacrilege. They were temp temp temperate in their desires, moderate in their passions, and candid and honorable in the expression of their sentiments on every subject of importance. So a, a lot of cap, people that were captured were drawn towards this, this lifestyle, and they, they, didn't, they didn't want to leave it. And, and especially since you would be fully accepted into the tribe, and women in Native American tribes had a higher status than what the women in, in colonial uh, mm -hmm. communities had. So that, that, that was another incentive, especially for women that, that, uh, that were captured. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. Um, anything else? Anything else? Okay. Scared? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of good stuff there. I, I want to add uh, my recommendation. Any of you who have not been to New Philadelphia, Gannat Hooten, uh, Coshocton, which is where the, the museum is that uh, Roland mentioned, that part of Ohio is truly fascinating, both for the Native Americans and then some of the religious movements, not that the Moravians, but there were some other settlements there after, after the Revolutionary War, some German, German settlements. It's, it's quite a historic area. Uh, reminder, next month, Todd Wilson, the month uh, after we have an interesting uh, talk, someone who uh, came to us who's going to talk at an appropriate year about the symbols of the presidency. He's going to be bringing memorabilia to show us and tell us stories about various election campaigns. And that same month, uh, we will, of course, have, uh, have the Penn Brewery, which is at its own history. We have this, uh, those of you who are interested, sign up for the walking tour. We really don't have a lot of spots left. We have some. Uh, we have this tradition of moving the uh, collectively moving chairs over to the stand over there to uh, set them up. Uh, hope you will join with that before you leave. Thank you very much for coming.